Good morning. My name is Matt Kuman. Like Justin said, I am a youth pastor down the road in South Harbor. Um, it's right in Byron Center, and I am so excited to be sharing the good news with you guys today. I'm honored and even a little bit terrified about being up here today, but. I'm honored because as I look out into the crowd, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, it's really exciting to look out and see a lot of you who, I, who I've been able to build relationships with, and it's been a while since I've seen some of you, um, but it's great to reconnect. Um, I've had the privilege of being mentored by Eric through high school and middle school, and um, through that time, I've built relationships with a lot of you. Um, Eric was originally the, my youth pastor and is one of the big reasons that I'm in ministry today. Um, so if this message is awful, you know who mentored me. <laughs> um, and like I said, th this place feels like family. There, there's a lot of people I recognize here. And that's actually the same reason that I'm terrified. Um, because you see, when Jesus returned home after starting some of his ministry, after being with some disciples... He came back home to Nazareth, and his, his family and friends in Nazareth ended up trying to stone him. So I'm hoping that is different here today. Um, with that being said, I am, I am so excited to preach here today because I've heard so many great things about the Foundry. I've been able to sit down with Eric and a lot of others of you who have said some awesome things that are happening. I mean, you're, you're packing the house the week after Memorial Day, and it's just so exciting to see all the passion you guys have. Um, some of you might know this, others of you might not, but today is Pentecost Sunday. Um, now, before we jump into the scripture, I want to talk about a few of the things that have happened over the few last few weeks in the early church. Um, about six weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, right? And a few days before that, um, Jesus was killed on the cross. He was tortured, um, and he rose on Easter um, from the grave. We, we've, we've known what's happened there. Um, but I want you to think specifically about the disciples in those moments. Think about what they might have been going through when, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, their Lord and Savior was hanging on the cross. Think about what they were going through when Easter happened, when Jesus rose from the dead, all those emotions that must have been, they must have been feeling. Um, but I want you to specifically think about one disciple in particular, and that's Peter. You see, Peter is one of Jesus' closest disciples. And if you know anything about the Jesus story, you know Peter has had his ups and downs um, through the, throughout the whole ministry. He's had some difficulties. Um, one of the cool things he's been able to experience is when Jesus was walking out on the water as Peter was fishing with a few of the disciples, Jesus said, come out to me. And Peter walked out on the water towards him. On the water. Isn't that sweet? Like that is super cool. Imagine that. Um, but he was also the man at Gethsemane when Jesus was being arrested. Um, when Peter took took a sword off a soldier, soldier's hand and he cut off his ear with it. It's like, eh, that's, that's not really what we're after, Peter, right? Jesus had to be thinking, come on, Peter, we're not here to cut off people's ears. This is ridiculous. Um, shortly after that, Peter was asked by three different people, do you know Jesus? Do you know this man from Nazareth? Have you been with him? Um, and all three times, Peter denies it. Peter denies Jesus all three times. Put yourself in Peter's world. His master, his friend, his Lord that he had been following for years has been crucified and is now dead, right? The man they were following was gone. And Jesus gave him a challenge before he left to go out into the world, right? And those were the exact same things Jesus was doing, and Jesus got killed for it. Think about the emotions, the feelings that Peter must be having. I can only imagine how fearful Peter is. I can only imagine Peter thinking, who am I to do this? Right? Jesus was doing some crazy miracles. Peter had to be fearful thinking, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I'm good enough to do that. You see, there were so many people mocking Jesus. What if people mock me? What if people try and kill me too? I can only imagine the fear in him, right? We can all sense that, right? How many of us can we relate to that kind of fear? 
Hopefully it's not the fear of being killed, right? But maybe it's the fear of a new child. As a new parent, you might not know what to do. There's a fear there of the unknown. I don't know what I don't know, right? Maybe it's a fear in your marriage. Maybe you get home at night and sit down on the couch in front of the TV because you don't have anything to say to your spouse anymore. Maybe that's because they hurt you. Maybe, maybe you can't trust them anymore. Maybe there's a fear of things getting worse in your marriage so you don't even talk about it. Maybe it's the fear of failing. Maybe your family, maybe your parents put high expectations on you to succeed in sports, in school. Um, maybe there's, there's pressure to succeed in your job. There's fear of failing in your job. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about fear, and there is no better place to start than looking through the lenses of Peter and Pentecost. So if you have your Bible with you today, please turn to Acts. If you got it on your phones, that'd be, that'd be great to follow along there too, but it's also going to be on the screen. Um, and we're going to jump around in Acts 2 a little bit, um, and we'll start at Acts 2 verse 1. And it says this, when the day of Pentecost came, all the, believer get, all the believers gathered in one place. Suddenly a sound came from heaven. It was like a strong wind blowing. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw something that looked like fire in the shape of tongues. The flames separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in language they had not known before. The Spirit gave the, them the ability to do this. Godly Jews from every country in the world were staying in Jerusalem. A crowd came together when they heard the sound. They were bewildered because each of them had heard their own language be being spoken. The crowd was really amazed and asked, Aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then why do we each hear them speaking in our own native language? We are Parthians, Medeans, and Elamites. We live in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia. We are from Pontius, Asia, Phyria, and Philema. Others of us are from Egypt and Rome. Some of the visitors are Jews. Others have accepted the Jewish faith. Also, Cretans and Arabs are here. We hear all of these people speaking about God's wonders in our own languages. They were amazed and bewildered. They asked one another, what does this mean? But some people in the crowd made fun of the believers. They've had too much wine, they said. Let's pause there for just a moment. First of all, I love the little details that the Bible includes like this. It's like, really? Why would you include that last verse? But later, Peter will address the crowd in the following verses that we're not going to get to that, come on, Pete, it's crowd, it's only nine in the morning. We wouldn't be drinking yet, right? That, that doesn't make sense for us to be drinking already at nine in the morning. And some of you are probably thinking, well, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? So that's okay. Um, so, so this is what's happened so far, right? Jesus has ascended into heaven, and he has sent the Holy Spirit to come down on the disciples. It says like tongues of fire. Um, and at that moment, the disciples are speaking in, in tongues that everyone from all countries can hear. And then this is where the story picks up. Then Peter gives a message to all these people. Um, so listen to how the story ends in Acts. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your, your young men will see visions. Your old men will have dreams. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit on my servants. I will pour out my Spirit on both men and women. When I do, they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above. I will show signs on the earth below. There will be blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn red like blood. This will happen before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we'll jump ahead to verse 40. It says this, Peter said many other things to warn them. He begged them, save yourselves from these evil people. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 people joined the believers that day. Isn't that such a cool story? Right? The Holy Spirit comes down like fire on the disciples. They're talking in all tongues to different people. Everyone can understand them. And at the end of it, 3,000 people were saved. That's, that's an awesome story. 
But there's an interesting detail in the first verse that, that I want to spend some time on. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. So if they were all ready gathered together in one place, this is obviously not the first Pentecost, right? They were all gathered together. All of these people were around this city for a reason, right? And that reason was Pentecost. And what we need to understand is that this, this moment where the Holy Spirit came down on the disciples, this isn't the first pe- Pentecost. Um, this, this isn't the first Pentecost the disciples would celebrate. Pentecost has been going on for centuries before this moment took place. You see, Pentecost is a feast that marked the end of the barley harvest and the start of the wheat harvest. Um, and in Hebrew, this feast is called Shavuot. I'm going to teach you one word today, and that's Shavuot. Say that with me. Shavuot. Yeah, that is the Hebrew feast. Um, and it's important to know that, yeah, I, I typically don't like teaching on like Hebrew and stuff, but it's important to know, the, know these things because, because if we understand what happens in Shavuot, we understand how breathtaking this story can actually be. So now you're probably asking, if this isn't the first Pentecost, then what was, right? When did this first Pentecost happen? And I got a chance to listen to a few of Eric's messages online. Um, And last week he talked about, he said these things. He said, um, when you read read the Gospels, you should read them understanding the Old Testament, right? The old is fully revealed in the new. We have this New Testament scripture that is just amazing. 3,000 people were saved. But we can't understand how breathtaking it is unless we associate it with some Old Testament scripture. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to jump back to the second book of the Bible, and we're going to spend some time in Exodus 32. And a few things um, that happened uh, before we're jumping into the scripture, the, being the book of Exodus, the Israelites start off in Egypt, right? They are enslaved in Egypt. Um, they're, Moses sends, or God sends Moses to free the free the Israelites from the Egyptians, right? And this is, this is where the story takes place. Um, you see, they, they had got, Moses got them out of Egypt, right? And then 40 days later, they, they wandered the desert for 40 days. Then they come up to this mountain called Mount Sinai. And this, this is where the story takes place. Moses has gone up there for 10 days. And it says this, Exodus 31, verse 18. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And after that, we're thinking, okay, yeah, this is great, right? The Israelites have been set free from Egypt. All of these good things are happening. They're walking around the desert together as a, as a free family for the first time in many of their lives. And they get up to this mountain and Moses goes up there for 10 days. And comes is going to come back down with, down with the Ten Commandments, the stuff that would be written on these people's hearts. But it's not actually all that good after this. The story takes a significant turn. Um, now, if you're new to the faith, I would suggest not starting reading your Bible with Exodus 32 because it, it really takes a hard turn. But I want to come back to this Old Testament scripture because when we read this and when we look at it through the lenses of Peter and Pentecost, it makes Acts so breathtaking. So read this with me. Out of Exodus 32, it says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Now, like I said earlier, Moses has been up on the mountain for how many days? Ten days. After a week and a half, the Israelites have forgotten the God that brought him out of slavery. Can you imagine that? Ten days and they're like, oh, I think we're ready for some other gods now. Let's have some new ones come in. Right? It's like, come on, guys. After ten days, you forget about the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Jumping ahead to verse 25. Moses saw that the people were running wild. Aaron had let them get out of control. 
The people had become a joke to their enemies. Moses stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Anyone on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the Levites joined him. Then he spoke to them and said, The Lord, the God of Israel, says each man must put on his sword. Then he must go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other. Each man must kill his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 people died that day. That's a heavy last few verses, isn't it? It's weird to think about why, why would God do something like this? Right? Why would 3,000 people die? Did that really need to take place? And I hope you didn't come here this morning expecting that answer, because I don't know. That's the truth. I don't know. And maybe that'll be a question I ask when I get up into heaven. Like, God, why did this happen? Was that really necessary? We don't have answers like this. But like I said, this is not a great story to start out as a Christian. But when we read it, we can look at the lens of Pentecost and see how beautiful and breathtaking it actually is. So let's think about what's happened so far. So the first Passover takes place in Egypt right before the Israelites are set free. So that's the first Passover. On the, um, on the other end, Jesus was killed on Passover. All right, so Jesus was killed on Passover. The Israelites are set for, the, in Egypt, the first Passover happens. Um, after, after Passover happens, the Israelites wander around in the desert for 40 days, right? And after 40 days, they come up to this mountain and Moses spends 10 days up there right? Um, on the other hand, end of it, um, 40 days after Jesus is crucified, he ascends into heaven, and 10 days later, the Holy Spirit comes down. Seeing the correlation so far? After 10 days, Jesus ascends into heaven, sending the Holy Spirit down. You have all those numbers that are intertwined, but that's not even the coolest part. Do you remember that le- those last few verses in Acts? said this, Peter said many other things to warn them. He begged them, save yourselves from these evil people. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people joined the believers that day. Did you catch that? 3,000 people were baptized. When we, when we look at this story in the Old Testament, we see that 3,000 people were killed. But in the New Testament, we see that these, a different group of 3,000 people were saved. Right? All these numbers intertwine. You see, on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> thousands of years ago, uh, Peter was preparing his message after Jesus was killed, and he was terrified. His Lord and his Savior was killed for doing, saying the very things that Jesus kind of commanded his disciples to say. Imagine how terrified Peter is. I'm sure Peter is having the feelings that I can't do this. I can't be this good. I don't know if I can do this. And I'm sure that the fear is telling him to run away. Think about what would have happened if Peter ran away. If he, if he gave into the fear and ran away. Would those 3,000 people have been saved? Right? Would those 3,000 people be, be Christians? Would the early church spread like wildfire if he had not given that message? Would we even be in this building today? Right? But by the grace of God, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. God has given us something to give us understanding that faith steps into that fear. See, fear in parenting would tell you to hide and pretend that you know everything about parenting, right? But faith says, you know, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do to this thing. I don't know how to get it to stop crying. Will somebody help me, right? It's asking for help. Fear in your marriage would tell you to get home after a long day and sit on the couch and turn on Netflix because going into a movie or going into a show will take you out of this world and put you into theirs. You don't need to worry about what's going on. You can avoid conflict. Sometimes it's the best way to avoid an argument, right? But faith says, honey, can we talk about what's going on? I feel like we've been distant lately. 
Those are hard conversations to have. But faith wants to make things better. I think we can all, we can all agree that Peter had some fear, right? But when he allowed the Holy Spirit to work in him, 3,000 people were saved. Why would we ever let fear get in the way of that? So, what is our response supposed to be? How are we supposed to get rid of this fear? How do we li not live in fear? Well, the answer is following up in Acts. It says this in 42. The believers studied what the apostles taught. They shared their lives together. They ate and prayed together. Everyone was amazed at what God was doing. They were amazed when the, when the apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together. They shared everything they had. They sold property and other things they owned. They gave to anyone who needed something. Every day they met together in the temple courtyard. They ate meals together in, in their homes, and their hearts were glad and sincere. They praised God, and they were, they were respected by all people. Every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. You see, when we let faith step in, we can change some things. Think about, what, think about what fear is holding you back on a personal level. But I also want you to think about what fear is holding you back on a church level, right? As a church, you guys have grown so much. They're putting up chairs all the time in the back, right? You have raised a boatload of money to pay off this building. And that's awesome. You guys are doing some great things. And fear would say, I want my church to stay this size. I like the people in it right now. I'm friends with them. We're becoming a family. Fear would say, I don't think we should be missional because I'm not sure of the type of missional people we'd be attracting um, if they started coming here. Right? Fear, fear would say, we shouldn't be missional because that costs a lot of money. To be missional, it costs money, and we shouldn't expand the budget. We should just keep it where it's at. We should give Eric a raise, right? No, not happening. Um, I, you see, faith says there are so many people down those Zealand streets who do not know the love of Christ. Are we going to let fear get in the way of that? You see, fear doesn't walk down those streets. Fear comes once a week and sits in a chair and gets filled up and leaves and walks to the car, and by the time you get to the car, you've forgotten about what's been going on. That's what happens when you let fear sink in. But faith walks down those streets. Faith collects money for the poor. Faith heals the sick. It's not about being in fear. It's about the church walking down the road. Listen to me when I say this. Foundry, you do not exist for the foundry. You exist for out there. You exist for the world. You see, that early church, that 3,000 that we talked about, um, they adopted kids who were being discarded by the Romans. They were just being discarded, and the early church took them along. Right? The early church um, were doing things that were radical in their culture. So what does that mean for you? Only you can answer that because fear runs away, but faith steps in. And honestly, I'm in that struggle with you. It's, it's, I say that, but I'm not perfect at that. I mean, yesterday and on the way here, I had just this pit in my stomach thinking, what if I say something dumb? What if they don't laugh at my jokes and just laugh at a serious part, right? Um, you have no idea how many times I practiced all those different people and places where they were talking about different languages. I'm like, what if I make a fool of myself in front of all these people? I don't know if I can do that, right? That's fear. The fear is present in all of our lives. But when we let the Holy Spirit come into our lives like this ready to, we can do some amazing things. So fear runs away, but faith steps in. I'm going to invite the band up, and I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, 
I ask that as we think about what fear, what fear is in our lives, I ask that you send the Holy Spirit into us to get rid of that fear. We know some of the amazing things that Peter was able to do with the Holy Spirit, and we know that we can do some amazing, th- amazing things too. I ask that you're in our hearts and you're in our minds as we're walking down those streets, when we're in our workplaces, when we're in our schools. I ask that you give us the words to speak in those moments. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to end with two things. Starting off by saying thank you for not throwing rocks at me. That was very easy. Um, but the last thing uh, associated with that, I told you that story about Jesus when he got, when he got to his hometown and, and they tried to stone him, right? Um, the last thing I want to explain to you is the reason that Jesus' family wanted to kill him. You see, when he first got to Nazareth, his family was actually proud of him. His family, um, it says in the Bible, it says they were amazed at the words that came from his lips. You see, but it didn't stop there. Jesus continued in his messages and explained to him that he did not come for them. Jesus explained that he came for the hurting, the sick, and the poor. And that right there is what made his family furious. You see, they were expecting Jesus to just come home after his ministry and preach to them. They were expecting to get filled up with the good news from him every week, that he would just stay with them. They wanted Jesus to preach to them once a week um, and for them to get filled up and to do that again in another week. They wanted his undivided attention. But Jesus went out into the world. So I challenge you with this. Found your church. Who are you here for? Are you here for this? Or are you here for those who are out there? Are you going to live in the fear of the unknown? Or are you going to let the Holy Spirit and faith step in? So leave with this benediction. Foundry Church, may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we know is inside of us now, go into the world. Amen. Go in peace.